morning, church. We're glad to see you all here today. And today is our Pathfinder Day. We have here with us a very special person, and it's Dr. Rupert Bushner. He is a native of Akron, Ohio, where he graduated from Butchell High School in 1978. He holds a bachelor degree from Oakwood University and a Master's of Divinity from Andrews University. He continued to sharpen his intellect at the United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio, and received the Doctor of Ministry degree in 1996. Dr. Bushner began his ministry in the Allegheny West Conference um, from 1985 to 2001. During this time, he served as pastor, youth and family life director. He was extended to a call to ministry in the Southeastern Conference from 2001 to 2006. He has served as chaplain at Oakwood University from 2006 to 2010. He served again in the Allegheny West Conference as Church Growth Conference Evangelist, 2010 to 2013. After serving there with distinction, he went on to pastor in the South Central Conference, 2013 to 2018. He served as pastor and men's ministry director. He returned back to Southeastern Conference, where he served as the co-pastor at the Patmos Chapel SDA in Orlando, Florida with Dr. James Doggett, Sr. Presently, he pastors the Ridge Seventh-day Adventist Church in Avon Park, Florida. During his matriculation at Oakwood University, he met the love of his life, Joanne King. They have been married for 38 years. God bless him and keep it, and are blessed with five adult children. The Bushners are the proud grandparents of nine grandchildren, one deceased and one great-grandson. In his own words, preaching is a privilege to talk about his best friend, Jesus. He has shared the gospel message in South, excuse me, in South Africa, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Canada, Bermuda, and Caribbean islands, and coast to coast in the United States. I know that I heard him for the first time about four years ago, was it Pastor Bushner, at the regional um, convocation in Tucson, and he really brought the house down, (laughs) I tell you. He really um, preached, and we were very moved with the Holy Spirit through him as a vessel. And um, he is a lover of young people and passionate about empowering both the young and the old. His desire is to see every soul saved into the kingdom of God, and that's amazing. His motto for life is, what you are is God's gift to you. What you become is your gift to God. What kind of gift? do you want to give God? I want to give God an awesome gift. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. It's good to be here today. I want to thank you for the introduction. Oh, the young people, you may go down so I can look at you. Come on, you can go on down and I can keep my eyes on you. You can go down here whichever way. Yes, yes. I'm going to be looking right at you, okay, so you can see me real good. But I'm glad to be here today. It's an honor, a privilege, and a joy. I want to thank Keisha for the invitation to come, who is the Pathfinder Director. And Isla, thank you so much for picking me up from the airport. Um, People always ask, how was your flight? And I say flights are all good when they land. Amen. Um, So I had a good flight, and then I had a wonderful driver. And she said, you must have felt real comfortable about me driving. Well, when she told me she was in the um, Army or she was National Guards and she drove a convoy, I knew I was in good hands. So um, she got me here right in one piece. 
But I'm glad to be here today and for our young people and to all the members of Sierra Vista Seventh-day Adventist Church, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior. I am privileged, I am honored that I get the opportunity to share with you the word of God today. And I'm always blessed when I'm with God's people. Amen. And, and today is a special day because we know it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, it's amazing because you can't remember something you don't learn. And so when we were talking about the lesson about remember, why does God want us to remember? First of all, you have to learn and you have to know. And when he says remember, it's something that you need to know first. And if you don't forget it, you'll be all right. And so there are some things you need to remember. For instance, the Bible says remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, when we say remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, if, you, if I gave you this white rag and said keep it white, it would have to be white before I give it to you. So therefore, when the Lord says, remember, number one, don't forget and keep the Sabbath holy, which means the Sabbath has to be made holy before he gives it to us. So we don't make the Sabbath holy by what we do. We keep it holy because of what he already done. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter two, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and God rested, blessed and sanctified that day. That's the reason why we're here on this day, the holy convocation. And I want to commend you because you got it right. This is the day, the day the Lord has made. And we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. It is the seventh day of the week. And God paused on this day. In fact, he didn't create anything. He, he paused. And therefore, he says, you are to create relationships on this day. Create fellowship on this day. On this day, create a bond where the koinonia spirit comes in. And the people of God has a place. We have a place where we can share our pain, our heartache, our problems, our overcoming, our victories. And this is what the knee is about when the people of God come together and we are to encourage one another. It's like a pep rally. You come from the world. I don't know about you. Some of you may have gotten beat up by the devil all week. Or we can come to this place called the Refuge City. And we are here now because Christ spilled his blood to make all this possible. And that's why I'm glad to know that wherever I go in the world, when I'm with my brothers and sisters, doesn't matter what nationality, doesn't matter what culture, what creed, he said, this gospel should be preached to all the world for a witness, then shall the end come. John said, I saw angels flying in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel to preach to the world. You know what that gospel is? God's last love letter to a dying world that we might be saved. This world has gone crazy. We're in a spiritual bankrupt world and I am so glad that God sent his son to die on Calvary so that we can experience life. You know, right now, this is just the beginning. This is the tip of the iceberg. When we get to heaven, that's when the real joy. But right now, the joy has already begun. And I don't know about you, but I'm happy about it. I'm delighted. I'm excited. And I want to speak to our young people. And I'm going to speak to us older young people today. <laughs> And I just want to pour something into their hearts today because as Pathfinders, I find that's a beautiful curriculum that we have in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Pathfinders. And it's really a beautiful curriculum because young people, you've done a wonderful job today to stand in front of people and to articulate, speak up, and then be able to do whatever God has asked you to do, sing, read a scripture or prayer. That takes a lot of courage. And I'm glad you were able to break through that because the best is yet to come. And the more you do it, the more comfortable, you, more comfortable you become. And before you know it, God will be using you in a mighty way in his church. And so I want to thank you, the people of God, for creating space for them to be able to come before you and have this opportunity to minister on this day. You know, sometimes our young people feel kicked to the curb or they feel like they're not a part of. But I want to say you are part of God's church and, and we love you and we want you to be a part of this. And that's why today is specially carved out and designed and designated so that you can know that you are part of the church of the living God. And so I'm happy today. My wife gave me permission to come. Going on 39 years, you all. I mean, I'm not henpecked. You know, nothing wrong with being henpecked as long as you're pecked by the right hand. Amen? <laughs> happy wife, happy life. And I tell you, I thank God for my lovely wife. She She's a beautiful thing. I tell people all the time, I'm running things in my house. They say, you are? Yeah, I'm running a vacuum cleaner. I run errands. I go whatever she says do. So I am running around because I just love her so much. And she's been a blessing in my life. 
And the Bible says when you find a wife, you find a good thing. And so I thank God for her, my children. I'm just happy today. Y'all excuse me. This is the day the day the Lord has made. And this is not a funeral. This is not a wake. This is a worship service. So if you want to just raise your hand, if you want to say amen, or if you want to just shout out like my brother just did, you get happy a little bit. It's all right. It's all right. Because the Bible says, let the redeem of the Lord say so. And God has been good to you. He's been good to me. He's been good to us. And so I want to go ahead and read the scripture reading. Now, the scripture reading was Ecclesiastes, not Proverbs. That's all right. But no, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And I want to go there. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. We want to go ahead and read the word of God. I'm going to start my timer. I see the clock back there. That'll help me. Because I tell people all the time, I don't have end of sermons. I just have to stop. <laughs> God has been that good to me, and I'll tell you why in a minute, why, why he has been and how he has been that good. Um, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we go into the word of God. Father, today we are so thankful once again that you have given us this day of rest, a day of holy convocation where we can come aside and worship you in spirit and truth. We ask now that the same Holy Spirit that moved on the 40 different authors over the Bible over a period of 1,500 years now would illuminate our thoughts to receive the word of God as a revelation. You said you do nothing in secret, but you reveal it to the prophets who in return will make it known to us. And so we wait on you, O God, and we know that you will bless us. For you've said in your word, the eyes of all look to thee and thou givest them their meat in due season. And you satisfy the needs of every living creature. And today we need to hear from you. You said, it is, it is man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so, Father, we need a word from you. Speak to us, we pray, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I know you have your Bibles in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm going to read. This is the New King James Version. It says, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Before the difficult days come and the years draw near you, when you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun is in the light, the moon, the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few and those that look through the windows grow dim, when the doors are shut in the streets and the sounds of grinding is low, when one rises up, at the sound of a bird and at the daughters of music are brought low. Also, they are afraid of height and of terrors. The way when the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper in a burden and desire falls or fails. And man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go back to the streets. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loose or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit returned to God who gave it. And then the preacher, Solomon says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. We, we live really in a world where his words are relevant today to our young people. And he says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. It's important because in the book of Ecclesiastes, in the introduction, it says the principal thing that he's talking about here is the meaningless of temporal things in life and the necessity of fearing God in a fallen, confusing, frustrating world. In spite of all that's going on, there is a desperate need to know God. And he's saying as Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, he's saying to the young people, in that text, remember your creator. And why? In religious matters, the author is honest and recognizes that we, we are in two, we, we're between, we're caught in a hard place. A catch 22, he says, we recognize that certain circumstances of life make life or make faith difficult. There, there are certain things in life that make life difficult, things you just don't understand. Things you can't explain. How is it that a young boy can go to school with a gun in his backpack and nobody knew and the parents, if they did know, why didn't somebody 
do something. They saw that he had written out and drew something on a page suggesting that the world would die and bloodshed. They knew that something was not right. And in spite of that, four young people are critically injured and killed at the age of 17, 14, and 13. It's confusing to, to young people to ask, why is it, where is God in the midst of it? I don't know. You would have to ask, why did God allow all this to go on? I, I mean, couldn't somebody have stopped it? Why the pain in my own life? I know young people, you may not tell anybody, you may not share it with anybody, but in your own life, the things that happen, the things you know that are wrong, things you know you shouldn't do, places you shouldn't go, or things you listen to, you know your parents are trying to raise you in the fear of God. And even as adults, we like Paul recognize that every time we try to do good, evil shows up. It's like, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? There's this contention going on. It's a war going on. I know there's a cosmic conflict, the great controversy that's looming large in the macro, but in the micro, in the heart of every human being, there is this war going on inside that keeps us from really doing God's will, and then we want to do God's will. It's like we're in the river, on the bank. Some days you want to be saved, and then some days you want to do your own things. Some days you want to go to church, and sometimes you don't even want to show up at church. You know, we are in a catch-22, frustrated about life itself. How in the world can you make sense of it? And for, for, for Solomon, he says, we recognize that the certain circumstances of life make faith difficult. We got to be honest. Some things make, make, make faith difficult. How can I keep on believing in a God when I see so much pain? How can I keep on trusting a God who won't show up when I call on him? In, in fact, that's the question of some people. They want to know where is God? And if God is so powerful, why did he make an angel that went crazy? Well, he gave him the power of choice. I always tell people now because our eyes are open, we need to be careful that we don't let an unemployed cherubim bamboozle us. Oh, you missed that. You missed that. See, if the devil is a fool, and he talks you into being lost. That makes us a bigger what? Fool. Okay, not you. It was another church where I was preaching. So what I'm saying is that faith becomes sometimes difficult because we're looking through a glass darkly, but one day we're going to see him face to face. And I'm so glad that what I'm doing here in this part of the Bible and the text and the sermon is you got to create tension. It's called the antithesis. The reality is life makes faith difficult. And for young people who have not been here long enough yet, it's easy to come to false conclusions. That's why it's important to listen to your parents. That's why it's important to listen to the word of God. That's why it's important to listen to somebody that's been there and done that. You see, I used to be young and now I'm older, but I remember at the age of 13 to 17, I really thought I was grown. I did. I could smell myself. I had about four hairs on my chest and nobody could tell me anything. I was doing my thing. I thought I was so smart and so wise and so full of it. And, and, and then it came to a point in my life at 17 years of age. In fact, 16 young people, I made a New Year's resolution. that I was going to stop doing something. And on January the 1st, I found myself doing what I said I didn't want to do. And it was a battle inside of me. It was no longer what somebody wanted me to do. It was no longer what my parents wanted me to do. It was my decision now to do what I felt I should do. And it's a terrible thing to be out of control when you can't control your life. It's a terrible thing to feel like I don't have any control. I don't have any willpower. I said I was going to stop, and I can't. I said I was going to quit, and I didn't. You know, you hear people say, I stopped 15 times. That means you went back a couple of them. So how do you keep from going back? I mean, really, how do you stop? Well, first of all, you got to recognize you got a problem. First of all, you got to recognize something went wrong. Houston, <laughs> we got trouble in the camp. See, something's wrong with the heart. Something's wrong with the heart. In this life, it's difficult to make faith sensible because we look through a glass and we see all the pain, the problems, and then we want to come to conclusions based on what we see that God is a certain way. But it wasn't until at the age of 17 when I was on a couch one night, I'll never forget it, my mother was reading a book called Steps to Christ out loud. And I was across the room, lying on the couch, minding my own business. 
And she started reading this little book called Steps to Christ. And for the first time, I saw and heard and felt the love of Jesus. I, I mean, I mean, come on now. I mean, I, 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 was, I was minding my business. I was good. I was good. But all of a sudden, something hit me. It, it, it was like a ton of bricks. The Holy Ghost came in like the mighty wisp of wind of the Pentecost power. It, it, it changed my life. I can put my finger on it today. I was converted. I went upstairs in the restroom. I thought I was losing my mind. I was looking in the mirror and I was crying like a baby. The tears coming down my cheeks like the Niagara. I'm, I'm just crying and crying and crying. But I felt like that commercial, zestfully clean. The more I cried, the cleaner I got. Boy, I felt like I was going through a metamorphosis. I felt like a caterpillar coming out of a butterfly. I felt like something was happening to my life. I couldn't put my finger on it. All I knew, I felt different. Something happened. Something actually happened at 17. And when I looked at the news and I saw these young people cut the life cut short at 17, 14, it messed with me because I said, that was the age that I met Jesus. And if I had died before I met him, I could have gone to a grave without Christ. But I'm so glad. I'm so happy now. I'll be 62, December the 31st. That's why people celebrate, by the way, y'all. On New Year's Eve, that's why they be partying and celebrating. If y'all didn't know, now y'all know. I was born December the 31st. That's was a great day. You know, they take, there are two great moments in life, the day you were born and the day you find out why. And I'm so happy that when I think about it, at the age now of 62, and I look back to 17, it was that moment that changed my life, the trajectory of my whole existence. Friends that I went to school with are now dead. People that I knew raised up are now dead. People that I knew, I mean, I played football in the backfield. Larry Wembley, I was a tailback. He was a fullback, and he's dead. He died on one day, and his mother died the next day. And I think about the grace of God. Another friend of mine was shot, killed. Another friend of mine, it was the grace of God that changed the trajectory of my life. That's why Psalm says, Solomon says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. I, I, I understand now, I understand now. I just want to testify to you because all I have is the testimony of my own life, what God can do. You see, this Bible, this Bible is not about Samson. This Bible is not about David. This Bible is not about Mary Magdalene. This Bible is about what God can do. Oh, I'm getting happy now. That's, that's what, when you read the Bible now, I was talking with somebody the other day. In fact, it was Elder Dickie Barron, Richard Barron, um, he, his daughter invited me to come anoint him in the hospital, and, and I was talking with her back and forth on the phone, and we were having a conversation. She said, Pastor, I look at the Bible different now. She says, the way I look at the Bible now is every time I look at the Bible, she said, I think about not what happened in people's lives, but what God can do. And I want to say today that when we read the Bible now, you got to look at what God can do. What, 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 when you, I'm, I'm serious, when you, you got to look at that Bible, what God can do. Because when you read Genesis chapter 1, what can God do? He can put one foot on nowhere and the other foot on nothing, speak to nothing, and nothing start becoming something. That's what God can do. Let there be light and light shows up. Let there be darkness shows up and darkness has enough sense to stay on its side and light has enough sense to stay on its side. Stars, he said, let there be and stuff start happening. Let there be and birds, let there be. And everything he made, he said, let it be. But then on the sixth day, he got down and got some clay, breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, and man began to praise God, and then he put him to sleep because he, it wasn't that he, he thought he needed somebody. See, I, okay, let me pause right here and help the married folk. Let me help the married folk, okay? Adam didn't need anybody. He was perfect. You say, wait a minute. That ain't what my preacher said. That ain't what, I, no, no, no. He was complete, but he was perfect. But he was not complete. Wait a minute. He was perfect, but he wasn't complete. He was only incomplete in that he didn't have somebody to put his completeness on. Oh, y'all missed that. Okay, let me go again. Let me come again. See, y'all stay asleep over here. Let me come on this side, help them out. See, see, Adam had it going on. Adam had a job. He was in a garden naming animals. He was tilling the ground. I mean, Adam, Adam didn't say, what's up, God? I don't have anybody. It was God that said, it's not good for you to be alone, Adam. Why not? You got so much in you, man, you need somebody to put all this completeness on. 
And so marriage is when you sow together, not perfect, but you're looking for somebody who's worthy of my completeness. Oh, y'all going to get that later. See, in other words, see, see, you ain't the Holy Ghost. You can't change anybody. I can't deal with their baggage. But when I'm saying marriage is about Adam, God saying to Adam, Adam, you are now ready to put your completeness on Eve. And so he made her. And then I heard the sermon, I mean, I heard the Sabbath school, and he read in Jeremiah 31 where God says, I'm your husband. You know what? God was feeling the same thing, and God shared that with Adam. And God wanted Adam to know, I didn't need humanity. I wanted humanity so that I could put my completeness on them. That's why he did the order of making Adam first, putting him to sleep, then making Eve, and then saying to Adam, bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. God is the way he loves the church the same way. You and I, <laughs> y'all excuse me, I might run. Okay, okay. You were brought into existence because God wanted to bestow his completeness on you. You're the object of his love. And he wanted you. He wants you. And can you imagine, young people, when you talk about this faith that we got to develop, if God is omniscient and if God is eternal, you know God never had a beginning. I mean, I can't even go back far enough to think about how far you can go back to think about how far you can go back. I, I mean, I can't. I mean, don't, don't you know God is so powerful that he knows everything there is to know and, and he knows thoughts that you're going to think that you try not to think and he knew you thought that thought to think not, you, not to think that thought. God knows that. I know it's confusing because he's omniscient. He knows everything. Can you imagine when I was flying 40,000 feet in the air, 40,000 feet in the air, I looked down, I saw all the different lights and cars. He knows everybody's thought at the same time. And then I thought about that. I said, can you imagine those of us here in Sierra Vista, if somebody's praying for a man here and somebody's praying for money in New York, he won't send the man to New York and the money to Sierra Vista. He knows how to do what he does. And if God is omniscient, that means he has no beginning. You know what God can't do? He can't learn. You ever thought about that? He can't learn because he knows all there is to know. Mm. Okay. If God knows that all there is to know and he never had a beginning, then as long as he's been God, you've been on his heart. There's never been a time when God has not been thinking about you. Never. Lord have mercy. There's never been a time when you have not been on the heart of God. You've always been on his heart. And you know why he rolled you out in this century? Because he wanted you to solve some problems. Oh, okay, you don't believe me. See, your function dictates your form. So don't, you don't even look the way you look by accident, by the way. So you got to celebrate who you are, black, white, red, purple, green, doesn't matter. Whatever God made, he had a function for it. Therefore, it has a form. Female, male, you are who you are because the creator's design and function and purpose for your life. And because of that, you are who you are because God has something that he wants you to do. Think about it. Everything in this room right now has a function or a purpose. And the purpose dictates how it's going to look to carry out the function. Therefore, young people, you have to understand, you got to feel me on this one. When purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. Got me? When you don't know the or purpose, and purpose not known, you abuse. You know where abuse comes from? The word abnormal use. So when you don't know the purpose of a thing, you will use it in an abnormal way. And there are so many human beings on this planet are using themselves in abnormal ways. And you can never be happy until you carry out your purpose, your function. You'll never be happy. You'll never be, you'll, you'll, you'll have camouflage misery. You'll make people look like you, you're all right. You'll smile and you'll, look, you'll tell jokes and you'll, you'll, you'll be funny. But at night when you put your head on the pillow, you have no peace. 
When you're all by yourself, you're not happy. You got to have something going on around you. But you know you're good when you know you're good when you can be good with just you and Jesus. And then when you bring that fellowship like this, you love people because you love God and God loves you. And that's why the text says, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're a self-hater, you can't love anybody else. So you got to find the joy of Jesus at a young age before the evil days draw nigh. That's why it's important to come to church. You may not understand it right now, but when I got converted, now let me tell you something. We were Baptist. My mother was Baptist. I was Baptist. Her sister was a Seventh-day Adventist, but I grew up around them all my life. They would take me to church. They would take me to Pathfinder. They would take me to MV, the AY. This channel is, I don't know what it is now, but they would take me to all those services, and we would get up early in the morning, and, and, and I would stay with them on Friday night, sunset, Sabbath, the sunset, and I always kind of like had a problem because I said, all the good cartoons come on Saturday. I got a problem, but I love them so much that it didn't matter. That's why you got to understand, the prince of this world made it that way. That's why all the good cartoons come on Saturday morning and all the programs come on Friday night because the devil is the prince of this air and he's fighting against everything God wants. That's the reason why at 17, you know what I did? I made a major decision about not playing football and people thought I lost my mind. I was in high school. My senior year, I was an outstanding running back. If I could reach back, yeah, I could pat myself on the thumb of the joker. But, but I, I was pretty good. I was pretty good. But at 17, young people, let me tell you what happened. When the Lord came into my life, this was the question I couldn't solve. What does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You see, this life is fleeting. It's transitory, which means it's temporary. It's temporary. See, the devil will allow you to get what you want, but you're going to lose what you could have had. Eternal life, that's more precious than anything. It's like preparing for the Olympics. Every four years, they have the Olympics, and people do all kind of exercise, working out to get ready just to get a gold medal. And you mean to tell me I can't take this one life and do everything I can do to get that eternal life? You live 60 years, 70 years, a drop in the bucket, and the devil played us to make us think that this was permanent, transitory. And I'm so glad I made that decision at 17. And, 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 and when I look back, I can't make that up. I can't, I can't fabricate. You see, what God wants each one of us to do with your life, make a statement about how you feel about me, how you live, how you live. Are you willing to sacrifice for me what I sacrificed for you when I gave you my life? And then the pen of inspiration, otherwise says, subscribe. What do we sacrifice? What do we sacrifice when we say we're gonna give up something? What do we really give up? A sin-polluted heart in exchange for him to cleanse and purify? What do we give up when we say we've given up something? Nothing. In exchange for eternal life? Man, I like that. Remember, 1959. A couple of hours before December the 31st, I had no existence. I didn't exist. 1958, I wasn't here. 1957, I wasn't here. 1959, I started being here. And guess what? If I let Christ in my life, I'll never not be here. I'll be here forever. Amen. That's the good news. You don't have to die. You don't have to go to life of sin and never. No, 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 I like it. Because see, see, death is just asleep. You know that, right? I'm not even afraid of dying. You see, not, nope. Can I show y'all how fast death is? <laughs> oh, y'all missed it. Okay, let me take off my glasses. <laughs> and that's slow motion. That's, that's, that's how fast death is. Let me show the folk over here, because they, they need to see too. This is how fast death is. The Bible says it this way. Living, know you're going to die. I know that. I know I'm going to die one day. People say, well, if you know you're going to die one day, why do you work out and eat right? Why do you do all that? I said, because I want to bless the worms in my death. <laughs> well, okay, okay, okay. Well, um, it's like Paul said, I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's what he says. I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. 
which means we should not all die. I show you a mystery in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye. And, 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 then, and then the Bible says, the living know they're going to die, but the dead don't know what? Nothing. Nothing. So when you die, it's just like this. Boom, boom. That's how fast it is. People think they got a lot of time. No, you don't have time. Only time you have now is the next breath you take. Because when it stops, you, you can't change it. You can't change your record. You can't change it. It's done. And I'm talking to my young people more than anything because, see, young people, you don't have to understand that you're going to be young shorter and you're going to be old longer. <laughs> okay, okay, let me, see, let me show you again. Okay, see, you're going to be young shorter and then you're going to grow up and you're going to be old a lot longer. If God, Jesus doesn't come and you don't die, look around. See all this gray? We old longer. And you're going to be old longer than you were young shorter. And while you're young shorter, you can't let the devil play you. See, what the devil does, he has to set it up before he sets it off. See, while you're young, you got to guard the avenues of your soul. Watch what you watch. Watch what you see. Watch what you touch because it leaves an indelible impression like a computer to be played on you later. See, the devil understands that. Well, let me say, that's why <laughs> if you read the Bible, the Old Testament is a coloring book for the New Testament Christian. Okay? What you see in the Old Testament is God showing us what the Christian is going to go through in the New Testament. See, when he said, go into the promised land and drive out the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Hittites, and all the termites, I mean, I'm the, I mean, I'm the, I get it. Because he wanted the land to have peace. He wanted the land to have peace. I'm going to give you the land, and you're going to drive out the issues. Now watch this. In the New Testament, Christian now, once we are saved, we're justified. The land was theirs the moment he said it was theirs. Now their mission was to go in and drive out the stuff. When you become saved, you saved. Now, the rest of your life, you got to drive out stuff. Usually, you let in when you were young. See, if I, some older people want us to jump up right now and start testifying. But y'all hold that down. Y'all hold that down. Let me. They want to say, he's saying you're right. I remember what I did when I saw something, and it left an indelible impression upon me, and now it's still with me. And now in my older life, I got to pray and ask victory, ask God to give me strength to overcome something that I let in when I was young. And if I could go back and turn back the hands of time and undo some stuff, there's some stuff I would have never wanted to see. There would be some things I never wanted to go through. Ted Bundy, serial killer. When he was on death row, he had an interview with Ted Dobson. And he, prom he told him, he said, please tell the Christian world, tell everybody to please guard their children against cable TV and what they watch on it. And he said, what happened to me I became, in, I became desensitized to human life. I became like a reprobate. And he said it started with this, and then it went to this, and that didn't please me to the point where he started killing women because he became desensitized at a young age. And all we saw was the results of something that happened when we couldn't see it. See, the devil never tells you he's a devil when he comes. He comes in a way to give you what you want. That's why the Bible says, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God tempts no man with evil. Every person is tempted when they're drawn away with their own stuff. So the devil has to set it up first before he tempts you. He has to get it in you and uh, allow you to open up the door. And that's why Jesus said, I saw the prince of this world coming, but he couldn't find anything in me because he shut it down with it is written. He didn't debate with the devil. He didn't counsel with the devil. He said, it is written. I understand what you're saying. I know what you're saying. But what does the Bible say? 
just how you got to live your life. I understand what you're saying. I know what you're saying. It sounds good. It might feel good. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. It might sound good right now, but where would it lead me? It might look good right now, but where would it lead me? If I do that, like Joseph said, if I do that, how can I sin against God and be okay? How can I do this and still maintain my mind without losing it? How can I still do, do wrong and be all right? You can't. It's like putting old wine in new bottles lest it burst. It's called homostasis. It's called incongruency. See, there's no way in the world you're going to either change your belief or you're going to change your behavior or you're going to lose your mind. That's why when you find people leaving the truth, they go the craziest, they're the wildest, and they, not, not, not in this church. No. I mean, when we leave the church, drink more wine than everybody else, smoke more weed than everybody else, and then we come up with new theories more than anybody else. We dance wilder than everybody else. We crazy. Because, <laughs> see, when you leave God, you're on your way down. There's no mistake about it. That's why the Bible says it this way. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Why? Because he says what happened is something going to happen. In fact, if you, if you go back to the few verses in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and begin at verse 9, this is what the Bible says. You go back to verse 9, it says this. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. See, the Bible is not written in chapters and verses, but they chopped it up. And actually, it should continue Verse 9, 10, and then goes down into 12, 1. And if you read it that way, listen to what it says. It says, rejoice, O young person, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart, in the sight of your eyes. In other words, but it says, go ahead, do what you want to do. Live your life the way you want to live it. Have a good time. Do your thing, but know this. God will bring it into judgment. That's what it's saying. It's saying. In other words, go ahead. <laughs> live your life the way you want to live it. I don't care what anybody said. At the end of the day, there's a God that we have to answer to. Do your thing. Whatever you feel like you want to do, I'll respect that. As long as it doesn't infringe on another person's life and create something for them, people say, well, I want to live my life the way I want to live it. Well, when it starts having a problem, when it affects other people, then you're not living your life the way you want to live it. It's impacting other people. But as far as freedom of choice, you got to have choice. You can't develop without choice, young people. That's why you got to have choice. You can't grow without choice. God is not going to give you this and say, do it. He's not going to do it. He, here's a choice. You can do whatever you want to do. Notice what the text says, and I'm almost finished. It says, you can do whatever, walk in the ways of your heart, in the sight of your eyes, but know that of all these things, God will bring in the judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart. Put away evil from your flesh and childhood and your youth and vanity. And then it says in verse 1 of chapter 12, remember your creator while you can before the day comes and you can't remember now your creator, young people, because what the devil going to do while you're young, he sets it up. And then when you get older, you wonder why do I have a proclivity or a leaning or a bent towards this? Why is this in me? Why do I want to do this? Number one, Genetically, you inherited some stuff from your mom, your dad. You, you got it called, it called inherited tendencies, and then you got cultivated tendencies. You got habits you develop, and you got genetic stuff in you, and you got to understand that is in you. And then you got to decide what's your future. And by the way, you don't decide your future, your habits do. The choices, 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 choices. Choice. Every morning we wake up, we get two C's, a chance and a choice. You get another chance to make another choice. And guess what happens? Over a period of time, it's called the compound effect. You keep making certain choices, they're going to take you somewhere. Darren Hardy in his book, Compound Effect, he says, make smart choices consistently over a period of time, you have amazing results. Smart choices consistently. And that's why I, I commend you, people of God. You consistently seek God in spite of the pressure you go through. 
You keep on praying in spite of the difficulties you go through. You keep on having disciplines, reading your Bible, and you keep doing that. And the Bible says the path of the just shines more and more, which means as a child of God, every step you take, this is what happens. You take steps, God gives you just enough light for that moment, and then he gives you just enough light for the next moment, and then he gives you enough light for the next moment. He doesn't show you all the way down your journey because it will intimidate you and scare you because there's some stuff down there you're not ready yet, but God develops your character so by the time you get there you're stronger now you thought you never could have handled it but because you kept on walking by faith and your faith muscle kept on developing and you kept on growing and you kept on persevering and you kept on pushing and Paul said I forget the past and I press and I reach I forget I press and I reach that's what a Christian got to do continual you got to forget what happened in yesterday forget it the devil gonna bring it back and when the devil keep bringing up your past start bringing up his future that's right. In fact, get you a book of matches and light it. Psh, and just tell the devil, you just look familiar. It's all fire. And one day you and your demons are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. But I'm going to be walking on streets of gold. I'm going to be getting the leads of the nation for the healing of the nations. I'm going to be getting a different fruit every month. I'm going to have a mansion somewhere. And then I'm going to have a house downtown. And I'm going to be blessed. You got no future. See, the devil has no future. You know what Ellen White says? When the devil sinned, he sinned in the light of choice. He's, he sinned in the light of God's glory. For him, there was nothing else God could do because he sinned knowing right and wrong. You know the devil was a covering cherub? This is what blows my mind. This brother stood in the presence of God, looking down at the Shekinah glory, had all part harmony in his voice. He could be the bass, tenor, soprano, and the alto all at the same time. He could be the orchestra and the band and play the piano like my sister just played. He could do all of that. Brother was bad. That boy was bad. And all the chips, the red Doritos, the blue bags, the purple bag, the barbecue chip. The boy had it going on. But some way he said, I'm going to be like God. I'm going to exalt my throne and I'm going to be more than that. See, he wanted God's power, but he didn't want God's character. That's the difference. See, he wanted to be, he wanted, he wanted to act like God, but he didn't want to be God. And this angel fought God. It wasn't long. <laughs> the battle didn't last. The Bible says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought young people. And the Bible says, and there was no place found for him anymore, which means you ain't got to go home, but you're getting up out of here. That's what the Lord told him. And, the, and he was gone. Just like that. The battle didn't even last long. And now he's come down here with great wrath. So now the devil, who was a beautiful angel, made a devil out of himself because he chose that. But his choice was final. But do you know what she goes on to say, Ellen White? She says, but for us, there was hope. Ooh, if that don't make you shout, I don't know what will. There was hope for us. There was hope. Why? Because she says, for us. We did not know what he knew, and therefore, she said, our minds were darkened through the sophistry of the devil. The height and the depth of God's love, we didn't know. But by beholding his character and by knowing his love, we could be drawn back to God. Ooh, I love it, I love it, I love it. So you ain't got to be perfect. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to have all, no, you keep coming to Jesus. And as you come to Jesus, he's accepting you just as you are. Then he, begins, and then he begins to clean you up. Trials are given in the school of Christ to purify God's children from the dross of earthliness. It's because God sees something in all of us that he allowed trying moments to come in your life. That's why you go through trials, because he has a curriculum for you. I don't know what the curriculum is for you, but I know if God is the superintendent of education and glory, he has an education, a training, and he has a curriculum for your life that's designed to get you to glory, and you got to count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. And when the devil throws something at you, you got to get to the point where you say, is that all you got? That's right. You got to tell that that all you got. That ain't, I'm like Paul. Nothing is going to separate me from the love of God. Nothing is going to cause me to walk out on the one who hung on a cross called Calvary. I'm never going to stop loving. I'm going to love him until the day I breathe my last breath. And with a made up mind like that, the devil don't know what to do with you. And guess what? The devil might throw a stumbling block. <laughs> he throws something at you and it just makes you go higher. You just got to say, thank you, Mr. Devil. 
Then he throws something else. Thank you. I said, I got to get me some stationary thank you cards and send them to the devil and say, thank you for every trial you sent because all it did was drive me closer to Jesus. Thank you, devil. You're just making me pray more. Thank you, devil. You're making me fast more. Thank you. You're making me read my Bible more because I know about you. You are a lost, lunatic, a liar, and you have no future. And I'm going to trust and obey because there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. I'm going to keep my mind stayed on him that he might keep me in perfect peace. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. It never said the weapon wouldn't be formed. Let me pause right there. It never said the weapon wouldn't be formed. It said it wouldn't prosper. It never said they won't talk about you. It won't prosper. It never said they won't stab you in the back on your job. It won't prosper. It never said that you might go through hell in hot water. It won't prosper. And by the way, <laughs> if you ever want to get a testimony, I know how to deal with hot water. Next time you take that peppermint tea bag and put it in the hot water, put your ear close to it and let the tea bag testify. You know what it'll tell you? Oh, I'm at my best when I'm in hot water because my flavor come out. Oh, y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. See, 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 the tea bag said, don't make it lukewarm. Don't make it cold. I'm at my best when I'm in a hot situation because what's in me comes out. That's why when trials come in your life, what's in you come out. Prize fighters are not made in the ring. They're revealed in the ring. Christians are not made in life. They're revealed in life. You're built on your knees with Jesus. The time you spend with him, like Enoch, he walked with God until he was not. Y'all want me to quit? I'm about to quit. Here it is. He said, he walked with God until he was not. You get anything? Don't Notice what he says here. Notice what he says here, and, and I'm about to quit. He says, not only the circumstances of life make faith difficult, but he also states that giving up faith will only make life even less undesirable and completely meaningless. So it's almost like you, you caught in a hard place. Do you feel me? In other words, life makes faith difficult, but if you give up your faith, life going to be even more difficult. See the tension? See, in other words, life can cause you to say, I don't believe that. But if you don't believe that, then you don't have anything to hold on to. Then you, then you toss to and fro. Then you lost without, it's almost like jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. It's like the devil played you. I've seen people say, well, you know what? That church don't treat me right. I'm going to leave. I, I, they don't treat me right. Ain't nothing but hypocrites up in there. And I say, wait a minute. You got a problem coming to church because hypocrites in there. But didn't I see you in the grocery store yesterday and there was a whole bunch of hypocrites in there? You didn't stop shopping. <laughs> I ain't never seen nobody go in the grocery store with their bags. Oh, man, I can't go get my food. Oh, I'm going out because there's too many hypocrites up in here. Nobody go to a basketball game or football game and see everybody drinking beer and everything, doing their thing. I'm leaving out here. Why? Because these people ain't living right. Huh? They, but you come to church and look for an excuse. He said, let the wheat and tear grow together. Don't be played by the devil. I'm going to lead the church. Where you going to go? You know when people say, I'm going to lead the church. You know what they really saying? I'm going to lead this church. Where you going? To hell. <laughs> what you going to do? What you going to do? I know life makes it difficult to have faith, but if you don't have faith, man, you're going to make life even more difficult. I know life is difficult. I know we all got problems. We all go through something. But if you don't have somebody you can turn to, what are you going to do when death comes? What are you going to do when sickness comes? What are you going to do when hardship comes? I don't know how people can live without God because when I stand by people who have lost loved ones, I've got the hope that one day you will live again. This is not the end. Only a comma. This is not a period. You will rise up and live again. Young people, let me just close with this. I got two bottles here, and one of them has something in it called water. Now, I can blow on this, but I can't cause it to do anything because it got substance in it. I can't. I would like to say that's the Holy Ghost, the water, okay? It keeps it. It sustains it. But see, in life, when you don't have something to sustain you, what happens? Why is this bottle collapsing? Not because I'm sucking the air out. It's because 
the air on the outside is greater than the air on the inside. You know why people collapse? You know why humanity can't take the pressures in life? Because it comes a time when mama can't do it for you. Daddy's no longer there. Uh, uncles, nieces, even the members. You got to stand between you and God. And guess what happens? If you don't have something on the inside, you're going to collapse. That young boy in Michigan collapsed. And nobody knew it. There are people right now collapsing around us. Don't know it until finally you see the results. Wow, I didn't know that. Life gone. They're a statistic now either in jail, either dead, life now is over because they didn't process themselves when they could have. Coming to church is like getting pressurized. The more the Holy Ghost in your life, you're able to deal with life because life going to come at all of us. When I, my boys growing up, family, <laughs> they always have a problem about washing dishes. I don't want to watch this. I, 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 I listened to him for a minute. I said, you eat up all the food and you're talking about you got a problem watching this? So you got choices. You can go somewhere else and not even have the food to eat. <laughs> you want to be grown? <laughs> then they thought about it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I used to think when I was growing up, I said, man, when I get older, I'm going to get a book just like that book my mother got. And it was, she would open it up and she would write on it and tear off something and give it to folk. And we'd walk out the store with food and toys and I said I'm gonna give me a book just like that when I got old I realized that with that book you gotta have something in the bank and if you write too many of them they come looking for you <laughs> so I recognize life is not as easy as I thought it was and now I understand that life is about choices L life is about processing and now, now I understand that if you don't understand how to get processed Life going to cave in on you. I'm praying today for our young people that, that all of us will recognize you only got one life to live. And you got to come to know Jesus. And no matter what the pressure is, no matter what the situation is, you got to turn to him. He's a brother. He sticks closer than a brother. He says, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. I will in no wise cast you out. Come unto me, all that labor and heavy labor. I'll give you rest. That's what God says today. And I'm so glad, young people, that you have that choice. And my prayer for you is that you give him your heart, give him your life, and let him do what he wants to do with you. He has a perfect will for your life. And if you submit, let go and let God, man, he'll give you the desires of your heart. As a result of me doing that, making that decision at 17, I've been around the world. I've been places that I never could have probably afforded. I've been able to talk about somebody that I love, and his name is Jesus. I mean, it, it, it's like I feel like I, I ought to be paying people for doing this. But God is good, and he'll give you that desire. He'll give you that heart desire for people and a love for his people. I'm praying, Father, you have been so good to us. Today, I thank you for Sierra Vista, Seventh-day Adventist Church, every member, Lord. I pray that you'll continue to urge us on in this journey. Sometimes life will make faith difficult, but then, Lord, we recognize without faith, life will be a torment. So we got to trust because you said, he that come to me must believe. And without faith, it's impossible to please me. So, Father, we pray for grace to trust you more. And, Lord, under the sound of my voice, even as I pray this prayer, if there's someone here today who need to recognize Christ as their Savior, while we're praying, even while we're having our, our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, Lord, that person that's here, young or old, who feel the need to say, yes, God, I, I need to surrender my life to you. I'm going to ask that they would stand right now, whoever they are, wherever they are, Lord, to say, yes, God, I've been running and I recognize I need to submit my life to you. I'm tired of carrying the burden of sin. I'm tired of trying to figure it out on my own. I've been going through this struggle and now I know that 
Without you, I'll never have peace. Father, I pray for that person right now that if they, if they would stand or even give their names to the pastor or one of the elders as they leave today, write their name down, the number, and say, hey, I'm drowning. I need help. I can't make it any longer on my own. I've come to the end of my humanity, and now I need divine intervention. I thank you for your Holy Spirit who's here right now, moving on the hearts of your people. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the spirit of prophecy. I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the fellowship of the members. And most of all, God, I thank you for you dying on the cross, shedding your blood, then sending the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. We pray today, God, that we will be ready when you come back and that we want to be able to say, Lo, this is our God whom we waited for. And then we want to hear you, Lord Jesus, say, well done, Sierra Vista. Well done, thy good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy. We love you. We honor you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.